the Samsung program. My son was frustrated. He had hit a child, killed him, and was out for murder. He has serving now 25 years to life. And when I entered into him serving his time, I was a mess. We're on the outside, paying the bills, sending the money, going to see them, taking care of everything in the household. And that's a lot. That is a big load. Plus feeling the guilt and everything that goes along with them being inside. You feel like you're doing time right alongside them. At this point, I didn't mention that I had a son at the church. My husband and I and my daughter were attending. I was embarrassed, I was angry at my son, so I just cut myself totally off from him. I was cleaning the church one day and I noticed these Kairos um, guest reservation forms on the table. And I was looking at it and it started talking about incarceration. And I put it in. But something was steering me back. God was ready to have me start my up and I attend this wonderful weekend. I had met so many Christian women and other guests that had been in the same boat as I was. I got to give things away and turn them into God that weekend. And I had to pay it forward. So I started becoming a part of that Kairos community. After I was a guest on Kairos weekend, I was getting the need, and I'm sure it was God behind it, pushing me to go down to see my son in Georgia. And I needed to, I needed to see him because it was 15 years since I had talked to him. I had to stay a couple days and we actually, we actually talked. And it was, it was wonderful. And that just broke me. And I knew, maybe right then and there, our God was back together. To this day, it is so strong. Fresh start. Kairos brings the family together and keeps the unity in the family. It changed my life. Kairos changed my life. And now I serve the Lord unconditionally. Unconditionally. Kairos changed my life as well. Things I laid down at the retreat that I've had all my life, pain and hurt, um, after I laid it down, was gone. And I realized like six months later, I'm like, wait, where'd that pain go? It was like gone. And I've seen so many women get set free of things that they, deep wounds, deep hurt. And Jesus just shows up in a way that, man, is amazing. His presence at these retreats is amazing. And um, so we um, usually do a retreat every year, but this year and, and uh, we're probably not gonna do it because of COVID, but we're still meeting and getting together. So um, right now we do every year, we do the Tour to Palm Springs. It's a bike, bike ride, a fundraiser for nonprofits in um, Palm Springs. And this year they're doing a virtual bike race so it's a way that you can donate. Um, I have raffle tickets in the back that you can buy. There's a dollar raffle tickets or $25 raffle tickets. Um, and it's a way that you can get something in return. I don't know what the prizes are. Um, it wouldn't load on my phone before I got up here, but um, you can look up Tour Palm Springs online. And um, you know, if you, or if you would like to donate something every month to the, to the ministry, you can do it online. Um, just write Kairos or um, when the offering comes around, put it in an envelope and write Kairos on it. So, thank you so much. Amen. Thank you.
destination place on a Tuesday morning for digging deeper. Well, we're going to start doing it this Tuesday coming up. We're going to be in the church office trailer. Um, pastor's going to be there until 8.30 in the morning doing prayer. And then we go live at 9. So you want to get there between 8.30 and 9. Um, right now, we're, we're talking about maybe doing like a potluck breakfast. But um, we'd love to see you there. Between 8.30 and 9. And then we go live at 9 to 10. Okay? All right, we're going to stand up and praise God. Worship.
children's ministry is dismissed. If you guys want to follow Deborah Dale, we're going to be in the room today because it's nice and warm. So if you guys want to follow Deborah Dale, she will lead you to the promised land. <laughs> the rest of us, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. So, here's, here's kind of a summary of 1 Samuel. Samuel was written primarily by Samuel and then had other prophets later on um, write some of the information along with him. So, when you see Samuel, you'll see Samuel as the primary writer and then other prophets later on talk about the kingdom of Israel. Now, Samuel writes from that aspect, from the kingdom. Previous to um, Saul, there was judges ruling over the kingdom. And then the people of Israel wanted to be like other nations, so they cried out that they would have a king. And so God gives them what they wanted, even though it wasn't good for them so that they would learn that there's no king but God. Hello. He is Amen. the ultimate king. Amen. All right? So we're going to talk about who's bigger. And yes, we're going to talk about the story of David and Goliath. Like, like I said earlier, it's kind of fun with the kids because I'm always bigger than they are, primarily. In a few years, uh, I will be looking up to Anthony and probably a few others. But right now, I'm going to, you know, hammer that thing home. The other thing is I want to talk about, and the reason why I picked the scripture, is I want to show how... Bible applies to our life. We think we're just telling cool stories, but there's more to hear than just a story. And we need to discover how the scripture applies to our life and how we can utilize it so that we'll begin to dig into it. And that's my whole purpose. If you dig into it, I guarantee you, you're going to find treasure. You're going to find who you are. You're going to find who you are because you're going to find who God is and who God is not. So, I know we're going to have a little bit of noise, so I'm going to speak loudly. It's just the way it is with lots of kids, but what a blessing. I am so glad to have kids. It is so much fun for me. So we're going to read verse 29 through 51. And previous to this, Sam, or David was anointed king, but he had to wait for Saul's opportunity to diminish. And while he was anointed king, he goes out to see his brothers. And as he goes out to see his brothers who were gathered together in a battle against the Philistines, he sees this great and awesome specimen of a man who was anywhere from 8 to 10 feet tall. And this man was crying out against Israel saying, Who will come and stand against me and fight? And this man began to curse the God of Israel. And he began to proclaim his God over the nation of Israel. And Israel drew back because they were in fear of Goliath. And David comes and he hears this mountain of a man speaking blasphemy and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this who's bringing a charge against God? And his brother's like, who are you to say anything, David? You're just a small kid. You're just a tiny little youth. And then Saul hears about this. And as Saul hears about this, David says, I will go to war. And Saul allows him. So we're going to pick up in verse 29. And David said, what have, what have I done now? Speaking to his brother, is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. When it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has both has killed both bear and lion, 
And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. And this is a bold statement. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God, gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Woo! Come on. Then all, the Israel, then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into his hands. Hallelujah. And this is good stuff, huh? Yes. A few more verses. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and he slung it, and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone, the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face <laughs> to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Therefore, David ran and took over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head. I'm going to stop right there because I want to give us the illustration of what this looks like. This is a pretty cool picture. Here's this youth. Ruddy, lean, skinny, kind of awkward. You ever seen kids at that age? A lot of times they, they kind of get awkward. They can't run without tripping. And here's David against Goliath. And Goliath was so big in comparison to David. He was so big in comparison to everybody else. But you think that David would have been scared. But David wasn't scared. We're going to get to the heart of that today. Goliath appears, appearance caused fear in the army of Israel. Caused a lot of fear in the army of Israel. Oh man, look how big this guy is. And oftentimes what we see causes fear in us. What do the giants represent? They represent big obstacles keeping us from God's will in our life. So as we're talking about Goliath, we're talking about a physical, historic figure, by the way. He's not a figment of imagination because there's history of giants throughout all scripture and not only history of giants but history of giants that went all the way down to Gaza where Goliath was from Caleb ran him off the hill and they ended up settling in Gaza in the for the Philistines and out of this place rose Goliath and giants represent these obstacles when we look at them they appear so much bigger than what we can handle come on church you guys ever face battles like that they're faced obstacles like that that is so much bigger than you. It's so much bigger than your ability. It's so much bigger than your bank account. I know that to be true. It's so much bigger than your emotions. So much bigger than your friends, family. Because remember, Job felt 
had a big thing going on. And his friends, instead of realizing that Job was in need, they said, what did you do wrong? You guys ever had friends like that? Not only are you facing a big battle, but the friends you sometimes keep make the battle even bigger. We have many giants. We're going to talk a little bit more about them today. But out of this, we see this historical figure, Goliath, and David went to him. David faced him. And you and I have giants in our lives that we got to face. Amen. We've been putting it off. Because giants always oppose the will of God. You know why the earth was flooded? Because there was giants in the land. And God was sick of it. You know why God was sick of it? Because it says they were men of renown. What does that mean? That they were living in themselves and they didn't need God. And giants represent that. Something that is big of the flesh that doesn't need God. And God wiped the earth because these were half-breeds between demons and men. Why does God do that? Because God doesn't want that kind of attitude. Because that attitude that we're big enough will keep us away from Him and what He can do in our lives. I'm not big enough. I keep reminding myself how big He is. How much He can do. David didn't fight Goliath in his own strength. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. The battle belongs to him. And as we see this chapter unfold, it's more than just a good story. It is a fact of life that we're going to face giants and we need God's help to overcome. What do they look like? How about depression? You guys ever suffer with depression because you made it more than what it needs to be? And you haven't pushed past it because it's so big that you cannot see how you can get through it? God's on your side that depression's nothing. How about your past? Your past ever become a giant in your life? All the problems that you've caused back early on, all the, all the trouble you got into, has that ever become a giant and it kept you from incurring God's will in your future? You kept looking at yourself saying, I'm not good enough because look at what I've done. How about the unknown? This is a huge giant. Amen. What's beyond this? And we don't strive for that greater work because we are in fear of the unknown. Come on, church. It's a giant. Now, let me share something about the unknown. Okay? If you bear with me for a second. You know what's great about the unknown? It's unknown. Why do I say that? Because we already know our failures. And sometimes the unknown doesn't carry our failures with us. So we're going to a place of that will help us be better or live better. But here's the thing that I really want us to focus on. When we think about the future and it's scary, no, know this, ready? God's already there. He's already prepared the ground. All you have to do is walk in it. He is the Alpha and the, Omega, Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And if we trust God in the present, we can trust God in our future. The unknown doesn't have to be a giant. How about family? We ever have family issues and that becomes our giant? You know, I, I'll tell you the truth. When me and Cindy have discussions now, it used to be total arguments and fights before. Mm -hmm. If it was unsettled, it would become a giant to my day. Mm -hmm. It didn't bother her. She could say, all right, I'm done. Go on with it. I couldn't. It drove me crazy. And then I would drive her crazy because I'd call and I'd ask her why and how we could work this out because I couldn't leave it alone because it became a giant. I made so much of it, it would consume me until it got rectified where she could just cut it off. And the more she cut it off, the angrier and the more frustrated I got. At least fight with me until I'll know. Just don't walk. Oh, because I'm impatient. Anybody else like that in here when you have a discussion with your other half? No. Okay. I'm talking to the church down the street then. <laughs> How about other issues? One I don't have in here. We can put it in the family as well. Illnesses. Yeah. Health. Health. 
even with family members struggling with hope. Sometimes we make God a giant. Death, we make a giant. Mm. Oh, man, do we make a giant. You know what the cross and the resurrection is all about? Diminishing that giant of death. That's all it's about. So we don't have to fear. All right, financial. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can make a giant of my finances. Or basically, the lack of it. Or really, my bills. I always ask, who's Bill and why does he always get paid? You guys ever make a giant out of your finances? You know how I dealt with that? My wife has charge over her finances. She keeps the checkbook. I don't worry about it. Actually, it's funny. I'm one of the least spiritually motivated people, or not spiritually, I'm one of the least financially motivated people you ever met. It does not drive me. It's funny because I understand finances very well. I went to college and I studied business and I understand the financial end. And I'll tell you, flat out, I hate it. I hate it. I hate figuring it out, and I'm good at it, but I don't like it. Because it's a, if I leave it there, it becomes a giant to me. And I don't want to live my life under it, its control. I don't want you to live your life underneath the control of your finances. Come on! Amen. You know what tithing is about? Removing the financial control. Because you're putting it back in God's hands. If God's in charge over it, you're just a steward, then you don't have to worry about making it happen. Doesn't that relieve some stress in here? Isn't that awesome? I don't have to make it happen, so I don't have to stay up late worrying about it. If I commit it to the Lord and I simply do what He tells me to do, He'll take care of it. Yeah, that's good. How about jobs? Your job ever become a giant? You ever struggled at a job? It became your giant? So much so that you brought that giant home with you? And instead of being able to have family time, you brought your job home with you and you're starting to talk to about your job with everybody else and it became such a big giant that you could never move forward even in your relationship or like this you get consumed in work to where it has total control you're overworked and underpaid right yeah because we put our focus on the wrong thing how about relationships? This is a big one. You know, if I try to build up my relationship with my wife without putting God first, it never fulfills me or fulfills her. Amen. It becomes a giant that I can't cross over. So here's how that giant looks. If she doesn't respond to what I do, then it becomes an obstacle. And then I start reacting to her action. That's not the way to live in a relationship. In living in a relationship, God's first. He gives me the ability to give, and I keep giving even if I don't get it in return. So it frees me up when I remove that giant out of the way. Then I'm there to be a comforter. I'm there to be a helper. I'm not there just to receive everything from her. I already get it from him. You see the fruit in this? You see the blessing when you get that giant out of the way? Then your relationship can actually flourish. You're not looking for the other person to do it for you. Oh, that's huge. You know? Well, I'm giving her all this affection. How come she's not returning the favor? And then pretty soon I built something small into something large. I don't know about you, but sometimes you can make a mountain out of a molehill. You know, I, I don't know why, but sometimes mine, mine look like Mount Everest. They really do. I like something little gets in my way of thinking, and then pretty soon it's so big, I can't sleep life without it. That's why it's important that we see the context of this scripture and we start facing giants. How about self? This is the key issue to all giants. It involves self. If you're unselfish, then giants aren't an issue. I'm my own, my own worst enemy. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. That's okay. You're trying, and we just appreciate the try. And we appreciate, right? Because that's what it's about, right? This is life. 
But here's the thing. When we, when we look at it, rightly, all our giants are about sin. Right? How about the demonic? You know where the giants come from? Just mentioned it earlier. They come from a crossbreed between the angels of men, or the angels of God and the sons of men. The daughters of men, I should say. And it's in Genesis chapter 6. So there was some sort of relation there that caused giants to inhabit the land. And God wanted it wiped out because it was ungodly. Why? Because they would not submit to God. You guys have any of these giants in your life? And if you leave them alone, they don't go away. God wants you to face them like David. Well, you might not have the strength, but guess what? It's not about you. Mm. The battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. Goliath did not appear so big in comparison to David's view of God. Come on. Amen. So everybody else in Israel saw Goliath and they were in fear. But not David. You know why? Because David saw the size of God. And he saw Goliath as nothing but a small thing in comparison to God. And if he served God and he submitted to God, then God was going to bring about great victory. Come on. When you look at these giants, it's let, it, the fact and the reason why they're so big is that you look at them. Right? David looked through it. He looked through, to go, through Goliath. I'm sorry, I wound up. Through Goliath and saw God. And in comparison to God, Goliath was nothing. In comparison to God, your problems are nothing. And that's where our view has to be. We have to be looking through all these things to see the Lord. Come on now. This is how we can get bigger victories. You know, the bigger the battle, the bigger the victory. God wants you to focus on who he is. And the more you see him, the more all these things that seem like they're big things become nothing. This is why David pressed forward. This wasn't that Goliath was big. He was. It's that God was so much bigger. Think about that. Struggling with addiction? Your addiction is nothing if you see God. You're struggling with your life here on earth? It's nothing when you see God because when you see God, you'll see that you're in his hands for all eternity. Struggle with your family? It's nothing because God says that he'll restore that. Come on. This is great and glorious truths that come out of the scripture that causes me to face giants, not run from them. And that's the issue. We have given so much ground in America as the church because we never faced giants. We ran from them. Come on, you know it's true. I'm, I'm sharing with you what's on my heart. I think I've discovered a big portion of my calling. I mentioned this earlier, but man, we're seeing small groups form, home groups form, and people are discovering so much. You know why? Because they're able to focus on Him. They're able to connect to Him. They're able to share and get their experience with Him. And that is what it's all about. we got to face those giants. And we can do that together. You know, um, somebody we're close to goes, I don't know if I'll go to church. Me and my fiance, doesn't, we don't like the church experience. But we'll come to a, we'll come to these small groups. And I go, Okay, why? She looks at me and she goes, because it's more like N-A, except we're talking about the Bible. <laughs> and then this is, what, this is what she meant. Ready? It becomes more of a support group with God. Oh, now we're on some, huh? When the church be quit becoming a support group with people in their relationship with God, we have allowed the giants to overtake our land. We've allowed giants to overtake our lives. We've allowed giants to overtake the lives of other people. When we quit being a support group. Hello. What's the church about? It's about being a support group. Amen. It's about coming together, talking about the Lord and lifting him up. So when people walk out of that, that uh, environment, they're not seeing life. They're not looking at life. They're looking through life. They're seeing from a heavenly perspective. 
That's awesome. That's where the victory comes. It's seen through our situation. So how was David able to see God? How was David able to, to see how big and enormous God was in comparison to Goliath? And it was through this aspect. It was through worship. David was a man after God's own heart. What was he doing out there keeping sheep? He was worshiping God. Who wrote most of the Psalms? David did. And he was able to worship God through all things. Worship is the way we lift up God. It's the way we keep our sights on Him. It's the way we magnify Him so we don't magnify everything else. And through that, we get the right perspective. This all comes from this scripture. If you want to see a parallel scripture, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it talks about, not giants, it talks about the multitude. The children of Israel weren't facing giants. They were facing a multitude. Too many. So you ever had too many problems? All Paula in at once? You know what Jehoshaphat did? He called for a fast. And as they fasted, he said this in verse 12. Lord, I have no power. Or he said, Lord, we have no power against this great multitude. Nor do we know what to do. But this is what he said. Ready? Our eyes are upon you. So even when you're facing so many battles, when you're facing the multitude, worship is the same process of victory. And then this is what happened. God told Jehoshaphat, don't fear because this, this battle's not yours, it's mine. And when they went out to fight the army, they put the praise team before the army and they came over and God already won them the victory. Worship is the way we elevate God. It's the way we get our perspective right on God so that we do not turn away from facing giants. David was a man of worship. David has trust in what God can do by his experience and what God has done. Our faith to overcome in the present and future issues are inspired by our experience with God helping us overcome in our past. Here's what David did. He saw Goliath. He saw God through Goliath. But one of those other things that gave him strength was looking at his past. I've already faced bears. I've already faced lions. And God got me through that. So what battle can I not face and not see victory with God? Come on. You know what allows me to do crazy things for Jesus? It's looking at my past and doing crazy things for Jesus and watching the outcome that God brought me victory. And one victory leads to another victory. Hello, church. And another victory will lead you into another victory. The problem is, is that we don't magnify victories. We magnify defeats. Mom, well, don't we glorify our failures? We don't glorify our victories. Faith is logical. How? If God was faithful in my past to get me through something that was impossible when I faced a giant. Is he not going to be faithful to get me through the giant that I'm currently facing? And will he not be faithful to get me through the battle that I'll face with my giant in my future against that giant? I'm building up my experience with God that tells me he is faithful through all things. You don't want to come together and share testimonies and we share stuff just talking to people, not necessarily in church, but just talking to people is so that people can hear your experience and they can grow to know that God is faithful. It's huge. When we're reading this story, we're reading about what happened to a real person as he faced a giant. And that encourages me that I can face the giant and expect what? The same results. Come on, church. We're not only building up our experience by the people in this room, we're building up our experience by the evidence of God moving through real people in the Bible. Remember I told you when we first started, I'm sharing this with us so that we can understand the application of Scripture. That this is not just a story. This is the reality of God working in lives when 
people are facing something bigger than them. When we face something bigger than us, we have to remember that God is faithful. And no matter how big that thing is, we need to remember God is much bigger. It helps. The sling was man-made and the stones were God-made. What's that mean? And I was sharing this one day and I'm like, wow, I get it now. I get it. I get it. He picked up the stones. Who made those stones smooth? God did. Through erosion. He said it was in the creek bed or basically the stream bed through the constant flow of water that God controls, right? The sling is man-made. So David fought that Goliath, fought that giant with his participation and God's. He didn't do it for God and God didn't do it for him. He had to face that giant and he had to use the process that God gave him to see victory. God doesn't do it for us, he does it through us. And here's my point. So many times we want God to take that giant out and we don't participate. We don't face it. And the whole time God is trying to get us to face it. Take what you have and face that giant and see what I can do. Because it will prove your faith. It will prove your faith. He, he didn't say, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to make disciples. He said, you go out and make disciples. And he'll participate with us as we participate with him. It's like the person that says, I want a job. I want a job. I want a job. God, you're going to get me a job. And they never get off their couch and they never fill in an application. 23 years go by and they're saying, God's still going to get me a job. Versus the person that says, I need a job. Lord, I'm praying for you to give me a job and I'm going to do my part. And they fill out every application they can. And here's what God does. Not only do they get a job, he can direct them to the right job. Ooh, big difference, huh? Like we shared with somebody recently. You know you can't have a better job unless you have a job. So we got to participate with him. God has you facing giants for a reason. It's because those giants exist and he's not going to do it for you. You have to arm up. You have to go out and you have to stand. If you don't, those giants will remain and what lies on the other side you will not receive. The cause. Going back to verse 29 in this, which is such a powerful statement. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause for facing that giant in your life? I'll tell you the cause, ready? It is fulfillment in your life. Giants are trying to keep you back from God fulfilling that thing. And the bigger the giant, the bigger the victory. You're going to have to realize, you're going to have to gain the right perspective. You're going to have to remember this teaching here today so that the next giant you face, you won't step back. You'll press on. Because God's got more for you than what you realize. And people fall short. You know why they fall short? Because they don't believe. They don't understand that there is a cause. There is a cause. I see people that are so gifted and it frustrates me because they don't do anything with it. You know why? Because they have giants in their life. Well, I failed too many times. Well, you know, uh, I would like to participate, but I'm really busy. Mm -hmm. I would like to do that, but you know, I've tried it before and it didn't really work out. And the, all they're doing is they're giving in to their giants. God didn't tell you to give in. He told you to overcome. There's, there's people in this room that are so much more gifted than me in teaching. I wish they would believe that. There's people here that are so gifted in other areas of ministry. You're so gifted, you don't even realize it. And the reason why, the reason why is because you've allowed that giant to speak to you and not God. What happened here 
as David was slinging the rock. You know what? He put down Saul's weapons. He said they were untested. David was familiar with his weapon, right? Yes. He used it several times. You know what the Bible says? That we have the sword of the Spirit. And that sword, we should be so familiar with the Bible that we can wield it any time. But the reason why people let giants win is they're not familiar with their weapon. Come on, church. If you would only believe, then you would not let those things stand in the way. It's not a sin issue. It's a belief problem. Jesus has cleansed you from your sin. So now what's your excuse? Come on. You have everything within you. You can either believe it or not. You can either stand and fight the giant or watch the giant continue to stand over you. All right. There's a challenge. Face and overcome your giants. Knowing that God is on your side. When I fight those things, it's not just me. I have somebody with me. I have a support group. That's what people don't realize. The church has become a support group for me. It allows me to take on those things that are way bigger than I am. And it allows me to see victory. You know one of my biggest fears ever was? Talking in front of people. It was a huge giant. You guys might not believe this now, but I used to make my wife order for me in restaurants. You need to ask for another soda. I don't really want to talk to the waitress. We had a daughter just like me. And she would get tired of it, but I used to be in fear. And then God got a hold of my life, and I saw who he was, and I faced that giant, and I started seeing what he could do. There's people in here that you have a call in your life, and you know it. But you're in fear because that thing has been so magnified in your life rather than God. He's on your side. Doesn't matter if you have health problems. Doesn't matter if you have financial problems. God is on your side. He wants to see those giants fall, but you got to believe it. i got to let things go. That's one of my big giants right now. I'm, i got to put myself to the test with this. Start with one this week. I'm going to tell you what mine is. Letting go. Because I have such a high standard that when other people don't live up to that standard, then I continue to hold it hostage. I hold them hostage by it. I gotta let it go. You know what that's keeping me back from? The blessings on the other side. Freedom. You know how much time I think about getting even or making them see it? You want them to see it. I'm going to show it to them. And I build up all these scenarios in my head. How I'm going to reveal it. How I'm going to show it. How they're going to understand. And then pretty soon I've wasted I don't know how much time. Thinking about something that's not even true. It's become a giant. I could be reading scripture. I could be praying. I could be thinking about how to improve the church. But no, I'm stopping short because I built up this giant and I haven't faced it. Anybody else like that in here or something in life? What are you going to do? David believed. David overcame. Here's this little shepherd boy. Let's talk about the weapons for a second. Saul gave him Weapons of war. David didn't take it. David used the weapon of a shepherd. What was mightier? The sword? The battle weapons of man? Or standing in the name of the Lord? The Lord's on your side. He wants to stand with you. And you need to push forward. Familiar size. Familiarize yourself with scripture and fight this battle. Don't let the battle overtake you. Don't let the giants remain in the land. You know what they were told? To wipe them utterly off the face of the earth. And whenever they did, these giants always became an obstacle. Yep. God wants you to move those giants by facing them and watching what he can do through that. Amen. Don't give in. You can't give in. This is life or death here. Life or death. 
He is on your side. So, this is for those who are watching. Maybe somebody in this room. If you have never faced that giant, which is you never have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and that giant will always remain, and you'll never see victory. And if that's you here, or if that's you online, it's real easy. Move that, face that giant right now, and say, "Lord, I repent of my sin. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior." Give me the power of your Holy Spirit to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you pray that and you believe in your heart, the Bible says you are saved. You do not have to fear death. God is on your side. For the rest of us, before we get into taking up our offering, I want to lay a prayer over this congregation. So if you guys would join with me in prayer. And this hits you, just raise your hand. Raising your hand right in your seat just as a way of saying, I receive that. I agree with that. I identify with that. And there's power in Jesus' name. So let's pray. Father, we come to you. We just thank you, Lord, that there is life in Jesus and life more abundantly. We thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We thank you, Lord, that our weapons are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and pulling down giants. And we pray that we begin to face those giants. We declare your word, Lord, over our situation. And we would see different results than what we can produce in ourselves. Father, I pray that you'd free people up from addiction in Jesus' name. I pray that you would free people up from depression in Jesus' name. You'd free, free people up from the financial struggles and hardships they're enduring in Jesus' name. God, I pray over this one giant to be removed Fear in Jesus' name. Cast it away and replace it with faith, God. Give us the ability to trust in you for supernatural things. I pray that we would go out into this world and declare your righteousness and that we would not be in fear, we would not be timid, that we would be able to stand boldly to proclaim the gospel. I pray, God, that you would not allow us to be controlled by those problems that we have magnified and made too much of. Whether it's a relationship, whether it's our past, whether, Lord, there's something that you've laid on our heart right now, we pray that you would give us the strength and the ability to face it. Lord, David's victorious, and we want to be victorious as well. Father, we pray over these children, just reminds me, we pray over these children that they wouldn't be controlled by giants, that we can be an example to them of how to press through and overcome. And Lord, we're coming to you and we're lifting you up high above all this. We want to worship you guys. So we don't worship anything else. And we pray for greater victories. We pray, God, for greater victories all around. May you consume our lives. Father, I pray over that person that's struggling physically right now. I pray that you would not allow them to magnify their health, that they would magnify your promise. We love you, we bless you, and we praise you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I can have our ushers, we're going to take up our offering, and then we're going to uh, close in worship. And then if you'd like to stay, we have cookies. Cookies and cocoa. All right. And bread. We have bread out in the back, so please take bread home. Please take bread home. And it's good bread. Father, we just thank you for the offering. Once again, it's the ability for us to put it in your hands. It's yours in the first place. So, Lord, I pray that you would give us victory even in our finances through the offering and time. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, I mentioned a little bit about small groups. We've been going to Hemet on Tuesday night and Wednesday night for two small groups. And let me just share with you guys what's been happening. I generally um, tell the leaders, I, I tell the people we're meeting with, they're both the homes that uh, these people. Go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead and cut me off. Um, at the homes, I, I tell the guy, hey, why don't you read? I'll just fill in the gaps. So they're not.